Good morning, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to uh, today's Lawyer Checker webinar, um, which is a discussion around the professional indemnity market uh, in 2021. Um, my name is Tom Lees, Director of Engagement at Lawyer Checker. Um, you will be watching this uh, on a recorded version rather than the live version, uh, as uh, technology uh, failed us all this morning. Um, but I'm delighted to be joined by Jenny Screech. Um, Jenny is from Howden, um, the insurance broker. Um, Jenny, thank you very much for joining me. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Um, a, a lot has changed since we uh, last this, did a similar webinar around two years ago. Um, the, the world looks very, very different um, to when we when we last did this, ultimately. Um, I think a good place to start is where is the professional professional indemnity insurance market right now what's happening especially ahead of October because I know there'll be a lot of people that are starting to look at um, their renewals round about now right absolutely um, yes certainly the, um, the the world has um, moved on a great deal in the um, in the last two years and for those of you who were looking at the Law Gazette last week, you would have seen a headline saying that it is the uh, hardest market for um, solicitors um, PI in 20 years. Um, and certainly um, that's uh, a comment that, that we made in our market report back in January this year. It is absolutely the hardest market that we've seen since the Solicitors Indemnity Fund. I think, though, it, it is useful to, to put this um, into context, first of all. One of the important points is that this isn't unique to the solicitors' profession. Um, PI rates have increased um, across the board, so other professions are experiencing the same issue. The other thing is it's, it's actually useful to turn, turn back the clock to 2000 and look at the premiums um, back in the times of the Solicitors Indemnity Fund. Because the last three years of SIF, the total premium collect from the profession was in excess of 300 million. Now, I acknowledge that, you know, there have been um, there, there were some extra cash calls that were included in that, and ultimately there was some refund to the profession. Uh, but the first year of the open market, that total premium collect dropped to 155 million. And the SRA and the assigned risk pool collected the premium information for the next 15 years. And in 15 years, there were only three years that it went above 250 million. Now, one of those years was a 13-month policy year, and if you annualise it, it was below 250 million. So, effectively, that means two years. Now, we stopped collecting that information around 2015, um, but our considered view is that it was probably not until 2019, 2020 that those total premiums went up above 300 million again. So during that 21 period, we've obviously had the limit of indemnity double um, for the primary um, insurance. We've also had claims inflation and we've also had quite a considerable increase in gross fees that um, the premium is rated against. So it, it is useful to, to look at that backdrop. Uh, as we approached uh, October uh, last year, there was a, a warning in the legal press that came from the chair of the Law Society PI uh, committee, who suggested that firms should plan for premium rate increases of up to 30% or more if the firm had issues in relation to claims activity. And that really was um, a, a reasonable um, suggestion to make. Now, some firms fortunately were able to bring their renewal in below that um, sort of threshold increase. But for some firms, it, it was higher if they had um, a challenged claims experience. So, yes, yeah, certainly last year, both April and October, we saw significant um, increases in the primary um, premium for the primary uh, two and three million cover. 
Um, also, really significant increases in the excess layers over the last couple of years, and the, the increases there have been 50 to 100 percent. Uh, but it's important to remember that historically those layers have been um, very cheap and, and, and what we've seen in the last few years is more claims that have actually been hitting uh, those layers. Uh, as a result, um, some insurers have left that sector of the market, um, which you know does create a, a pressure as well, and uh, and the premiums have have gone up. Obviously, um, it's still an important um, purchase, um, the excess layer cover, um, and firms need to be mindful that under the SRA um, indemnity insurance rules, there's an obligation to purchase adequate and appropriate uh, insurance depending upon your uh, current and past practice. So rate was up. Oh. Sorry, Jenny, continue. Yeah, I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about um, capacity and, and appetite, uh, because if a firm was you know, looking for a competitive quote or uh, a new insurer, there were some potential issues there because insurers, their appetite isn't, isn't what it has been, particularly around conveyancing practice. And what we saw in October was um, insurers saying that um, they um, were only prepared to look at um, uh, firms that did no more than, say, 20 to 30 percent um, of conveyancing as a proportion of um, their overall uh, fees. What we're now seeing coming into April is that being pulled back even further to, to something more like uh, 20%. Uh, so uh, that um, continues to, to, to be an issue, conveyancing. And, and Tom, you've helpfully um, popped up on the screen there um, some of the backdrop to this sensitivity that we're seeing around uh, conveyancing. And, and the question that's often being asked is, is why are insurers so concerned about conveyancing? And the answer to that is that um, both historically and again today, we see significant level of, of claims activity that comes from that area of practice. And if we have a look at this slide here, this uh, was a slide that was produced in 2010 for the um, Charles River and Associates report that the SRA commissioned. And it details um, the spend by various areas of practice uh, over the years of, of SIF. And you know, you, you can see there um, the very significant spend on, on conveyancing. You can see the fallout of the recession at that point in time, and also see just what a long tail um, there is in relation to PI claims, just, you know, how many years that, you know, we were paying the cost of, um, of that recession. So I think that's useful to, to form a backdrop because, Obviously, insurers are aware of this um, historic experience. And if we roll forward to the next slide, Tom. Yeah. Right, this is um, a similar graph, and this comes from 10 years of claims information in the open market. Now, it's only 75% um, of uh, insurers that participated in this exercise. Um, it shows um, payments out um, from 2004-05 year to 2013-14 year. So reserves aren't included. But again, it you know, covers some of the claims that came through from the 2008 uh, recession. And again, we're looking at you know, over 50% that's property and, and conveyancing uh, related. So, you know, once again, history is telling insurers to be wary of conveyancing. So having looked at that, let's let's take a look at the next one, Tom. Um, before we have a look at that, Jenny, I think yeah. one of the things that um, I, I want to focus on, and I think we, we will have quite a varied um demographic of people watching this in terms of the size of their firm so small firms medium firms large firms and you've gave a really good 
I suppose, overview of, of where the market is sort of right now. Um, what's the impact of that on, on different areas of the market? So if you're if you're a small firm with a with a couple of partners and a and a mix of work, or if you're a, a large regional firm, what are the impacts on on you as a business as to where the where the market is heading and where it's at right now? Sure, right. That's really an interesting one because in the current hard market, it's really difficult to sector, sector the results with, with reference to firm size. And, you know, we've looked at some of our data and tried to analyse the result with reference to firm size. And it really is difficult because it is such a mixed bag. And, you know, certainly it is the case that what premium um, increase a firm receives and, and where premium, its premium sits in terms of, of a proportion of its gross fees is very much determined by the unique characteristics of each firm, what the areas of practice are, uh, what the gross fees are, very, very much what the claims history is. That is a very significant driver um, in terms of rate. It also depends on the insurer um, because different insurers have been looking for different levels of rate um, over the at various points over the last two two um, two years that we've been seeing the market harden. So certainly our advice would be that to understand what the outlook is for your particular firm, it's really important to engage early with your broker and have that discussion. Uh, and you know, they will be able to talk you through what's actually happening with your insurer, um, looking at your areas of practice, where you're likely to fit with that, how your own claims history is going to potentially impact on it as well. So that dialogue now is, is going to be extremely important. And um, in terms of that dialogue, um, obviously many firms will, will know that as its, as its best practice. But what point roughly should they be if your renewal is in October and you haven't started talking to your broker now? Should you be doing that? Should you have done that last week, last month? Um, and what should they be? Should they be doing anything else that they maybe haven't done before in terms of, um, like you say, painting the picture of the business? Because it sounds like from what you've said that. Um, no matter the size is pretty much irrelevant, it, it's more of a case of you being looked at as an individual entity, um, which I think if you were running a firm um, means that you got to make sure that the picture you're painting is a really clear one um, and is a is a true reflection. Is there anything they should be doing that they, they maybe haven't done before? Right. OK. Um, first of all, talking about the, the timing, if you're an October renewal, uh, first of all, uh, give your broker until post 1st of April because they're um, at, the, at the moment, they're really at the coalface dealing with those one April renewals. But as we get into um, April, pick up the phone and start having that dialogue and discussion then. And, and they will actually be able to talk you through what you know happened in uh, in April uh, and some of the issues that you should uh, expect to see. Start looking at the proposal form as soon as possible because I think it's useful to even start looking. At, it might be that the October proposal forms aren't available in in April May because if our insurers want to adjust questions, again, there can be a, lay, a delay. But start looking at the latest proposal form anyway. Your broker will be able to give you that so that you have an understanding of what information you actually need to collect. It will also help to inform you of you know, some of the areas where insurers are sensitive at the moment, whether that's in relation to conveyancing, um, wills, probate and estate administration work, 
cybersecurity is another area of uh, sensitivity. And that is likely to help inform you about the risk management reviews that you might want to put on your management um, agenda to look at over the um, over the next few months. So yes, yeah, certainly if you're an October renewal, start the process. Proposal forms are longer than they ever have been before. And they take always take longer than you expect uh, to complete. And you know this is absolutely not the um, not the year to leave um, completion of your proposal form to the um, to the last minute. One other thing I would say too, Tom, is also the financials. Insurers are really focused on a firm's financial position in a way that they never have been before. Some of this comes off the back of um, when you say financial position in terms of profitability or cash in the bank. Both. OK. Yeah. Um, the, the real concern is the risk of firm failure, um, because, as we know, when a firm fails, um, they uh, the insurers have to provide the six years of runoff cover, whether they get paid for it uh, or not. And it was in um, about July time last year that insurers concerned about what was going to happen in the wake of the pandemic actually went to the SRA and asked them to change the rules and said, can you um, please change the rules so that we only have to provide the runoff cover if we get paid for it uh, and also change the rule that requires us to pay the self-insured excess when a firm doesn't pay it. Um, the SRA said no, uh, that that would impact consumer protection and they weren't prepared to do that. And it was off the back of that that we really did see um, insurers start to focus on um, financials and a couple of insurers um, are now requiring personal guarantees from principals in some instances yeah, I think as well. I've, I think I've seen that in the, in the press recently. Yeah. Um, were there, but I suppose one of the sort of reasons behind that was I know that last year there was a worry that some firms would not be able to get insurance and were forced to close. And I think, I think I've seen some numbers on this and I don't think it was quite as, it wasn't at the top end of what people were expecting in terms of worst case scenario. I think there were some instances, but it didn't seem to it didn't seem to have an impact that many firms were closed. Is that a fair summary? Yes, yeah. And it, the SRA have, have obviously got the numbers on, on that. And uh, what we do know, there was a, um, a report from the CEO of the SRA to the um, board at the beginning of December that said, that there were 47 firms uh, that went into the extended policy period uh, after the April, uh, after the October renewal. Now, as we know, the extended policy period is if you don't, uh, if you're not successful in renewing your insurance, then your existing insurer has to continue to cover you for 30 days, during which time you can continue to practice as, as normal. And then you have a further 60 days beyond that where you can continue to practice but can't take new instructions. So we, we know that um, there were 47 firms that uh, reported themselves in the uh, EPP. But if we look at the uh, firm closures that are recorded um, on the SRA website, um, in September last year, there were 83 firms that closed. Um, in October, there were 57 firms that closed. Now, some of those firms will have closed you know, because um, they weren't able to get insurance. Some will have closed uh, for other reasons. Uh, so, you know, certainly and, you know, regrettably, um, you know, there are some firms that um, have been placed in, in that situation as a, as a result of the situation in the market. Um, and it's either because they weren't able to get um, terms or they weren't able to afford. Um, yeah, um, I think especially with what happened last year, that that's completely understandable in many respects. Um, just just looking at that graph, um, and obviously the majority of our listeners will be either conveyancing or, or private client based. Um, what are the top three risks 
um, that are leading to claims? Uh, and are there any growing risks that are maybe not quite in that top three, but ha have certainly shot up? OK, uh, there, there are yeah, three three things that I think are really useful to talk about. You know, one, one is um, conveyancing. The other is the Wills Trust probate area. And the other one I'd like to talk about is um, is cyber security. Uh, talking first of all about conveyancing, we've, we've looked earlier at, you know, historically, we know that claims activity is significant in relation to uh, conveyancing. What's been creating a real problem in the last couple of years for insurers are the claims relating to buyer funded developments. And this is uh, where purchasers will pay what can at times be up to 80% upfront uh, to purchase a unit in a particular development. Now, some yep. of these have failed spectacularly. And of course, when people um, lose money, they look at where they can recover their losses. And we know that solicitors have gold plated um, insurance cover. Is that it's just on that journey. Is that also quite geographical related? Because um, that that seems like the, the type of thing that's quite from experience that maybe it's quite popular in London, um, or is it a is it a nationwide thing? Uh, yeah, there's been quite significant exposure in relation to what was known as the Northern Powerhouse. Um, up in sort of you know, there's a number of. Um, uh, developments that have uh, failed um, uh, in in North, you know, there have been you know some in in London, but of course, the other thing is that um, conveyancing and in, in instructions, you know, might have been taken in London for a development um, up north. I mean, the, you know, the the geographical um, spread is is really um, is really very wide. So. Um, Firms that that have been engaging in that, well, any development work. To be to be honest with you, Tom, there's a lot of questions in proposal forms now about new build development work. Um, so, it, to the extent that firms have any exposure in that area, they need to you know, ensure that they pay real attention to the completion of those questions in the proposal form because it's hugely high on insurers' radars. Um, you know, they are they have been over the last um, two years um, incurring you know significant um, claims. They're holding significant um, reserves in relation to uh, that um, that active claims activity. Um, on the conveyancing front as well, the other concern that insurance insurers have is um, the impact of the um, stamp duty relief. Um, because obviously we've been seeing in the press um, the uh, amount of business that that has generated uh, conveyances under pressure and we know that when people are under pressure issues um, can arise so that's causing a concern we've also um, some concern about what's going to happen when the um, stamp duty relief ends disappointed buyers or sellers who've had deals fall over um, because the, um, the, the, the the deal hasn't been able to go through with the stamp duty relief, that those individuals might start to um, try and um, pick their way through the solicitor's file to see whether there was any delay that could justify a complaint or, or claim. Um, we're also seeing some uh, multi-dwellings uh, relief um, issues um, in relation to stamp duty that's causing claims activity uh, and escalating ground rents hasn't been the catastrophe that was expected but there's still some claims activity so that's the backdrop to um, the the conveyancing concern and why I would put that on one of my top Three in terms of risk issues around around cyber. I think that's that's a really interesting one. Um, obviously, from our perspective at Lawyer Checker, we we help a lot of law firms in that area. Um, in that we act as a, an independent uh, assessor for their cyber essentials or cyber essentials plus audit. Um, and we often 
um, get asked questions around cyber, especially in relation to insurance. And um, what do insurers really want to see there? Um, because I think um, it's one of those. It's a. It's you've got to sell your story with, but using the right language. I would have thought is is quite important. What what are insurers looking for from a cyber perspective? They're looking for good controls. They're looking for training um, that's you know taking place on a regular um, basis. Uh, you know they're looking at you know for example like the the cyber essentials um, is an important um, issue. They're asking on the proposal form whether firms have got separate cyber cover um, as well. Uh, certainly, this is an area where, um, as well, post pandemic, we've, we've been seeing um, considerable increase in claims um, arising from cyber uh, incidents. And the SRA published in September last year their thematic review. And yeah, if we can just have a look at the slide there. That's yeah, many of our many of our listeners probably joined us for um, a webinar I think we did in November where we had the thematics team from the SRA on, ah. um, and we, we we had a good we had a good look at this, and I, I think there's some some really interesting things in there that really link into the training bit that you you spoke about, because yes. um, I think that's something that firms find tricky to to get to get the right sort of training um in terms of um do they do it in-house do they outsource it what tools are available to them if anyone has any questions about tools around training i can i can point them in the right direction to a number of different places but i think that, that, that that's really important for me because people wise um people can be your weakest asset but turning that round if you you, you get it right um, that they're worth their weight in gold if they can prevent if they can prevent attacks happening. A a absolutely, and I think you know repeating the training as as well because you know we all forget and become less vigilant. So I think you know having the reminders on a regular basis um, that that is um, is really important. Because for that um, to work, it has to become cultural. Yes, um, and it. And that that's really that that's why you need to repeat it. And um, one of the reasons I think we've seen in the last year an uptake in people moving towards Cyber Essentials Plus is because um, going on that cultural theme. And um, if you're sat on a board or a management meeting, and as a managing partner or a director, you ask what's happening around cyber, um, if either you've got an outsourced IT team or an internal IT team and ultimately you're, you're probably going to have limited knowledge in that area you may know a bit but not necessarily a lot so having that independent audit which is effectively what Cyber Essentials Plus is um, is just the same principle as why a, an accounts team would have their accounts audited or why you'd review conveyancing files in, in exactly the same way and um, we've definitely seen an uh, an upsurge in that, especially over the the last twelve months or so. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you know really is important. And and the last you know twelve months, as as we say, has been keen because it has been key because you know there's there's just you know so much more um, activity that we're seeing in terms of cyber um, attacks and and. Of course, I would mention as well the you know cyber insurance as as being important. And I was really surprised at what came out of the um, thematic review because there were forty firms that took part in that, and thirty of them had experienced a um, a cyber attack, and and the remaining ten had been engaged with clients who had. And yet only 12 of those firms had separate cyber cover. So I think that's you know, something that is useful for firms to put um, on their agenda. Obviously, it's um, also important if you're buying cyber cover to understand what you're buying, because it's not like the PI where we've got I think that's standard probably, MTCs. I think that's probably the reason. There seems to be a bit of a gap in the gap in sort of the market in terms of knowledge around that yes 
Um, and I think that's probably why that figure is quite low, because I think that's not that's not an anomaly in terms of the thematic review. I, I think that would probably oh, yeah. mirror the industry. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, an, an area that, you know, there, there does need to be, you know, more um, information and education about the importance of separate cyber cover and, and what you're purchasing, um, you know, what your policy is going to cover as well. That sounds like an idea for a future webinar, Jenny. So uh, welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the Lawyer Checker marketing <laughs> team. Um, uh, that, that sounds like something that we should probably probably do. Um, uh, one more question for me, um, which is around um, something that you haven't mentioned, but that was relevant a couple of years ago, and I think we probably spoke about two years ago. Um, lots of firms are now obviously using electronic ID um, because the technology has really improved. It's safer. We've obviously had the pandemic. We also on Friday had the land registry announce their safe harbour scheme, which is the first of, I think, many steps that will happen in that area. Um, is ID fraud coming down in terms of claims? Um, I think one of your colleagues mentioned to me last year that, that they were starting to see a, a reduction in the number of claims on ID fraud. Yeah, so it, it, that's been interesting because I, I, I think that there's a much greater awareness of the issue um, and, and, and fraud generally. Like if I think back to my days as an underwriter and going back to 2014-15 when we were seeing significant amount of, for example, um, the Friday afternoon frauds, you know, slightly different but still fraud. And there was a huge amount of education that was done by insurers, by the Law Society, by the SRA around that. And, and so we still saw it happening, but we saw a reduction. In terms of the ID fraud, we had the DreamVar um, case that I think really raised that issue in everybody's consciousness, that you know, really highlighted the importance of looking at red flags, and um, you know, undertaking training within firms uh, around that issue. So, in my view, that got people really engaged on that issue, which has been helpful. And the key is to then just keep one step ahead of the fraudsters, because you know, we know that they're very good at um, changing their their modus operandi to to try and um, and get to the weakest link. Um, but, you know, certainly I think that there is a great deal um, more awareness uh, of um, identity fraud, which um, it means that we're, we're not seeing um, some of the issues that we that we were um, back maybe four or five years ago. No, and I think that I agree. Um, I, I think that mirrors sort of some of the things I've heard as well. Um, and I think actually cyber probably run is running a couple of years behind um, in terms of that sort of adoption, that awareness and that understanding. I think mm -hmm. if we if you have this call in a, in two more years, um, um, God knows what the world will look like then, yes. um, uh, then uh, I, I actually think that we'll, we'll, we'll say that that a lot of firms have taken cyber more seriously and yeah. um, the insurance number that we looked at would would have changed um, I suppose last thing for me before we wrap up and we've talked on it a little bit let's look into the future um, the state of the current residential conveyancing market over the last 12 months means that there will almost certainly be an increase in claims arising over the next few years um, just because of what what's happened and how pressured the market is under is that a fair assessment do you think um in, in terms of what's to come um uh, yes you know I, th I think that what happens with the property market is is going to be key um and you know what we also know is and and if we you know thinking back to the sif graph that we looked at earlier you know we we know that PI claims have a very long tail. So 
there's some real concern at the moment amongst insurers about you know what the the fallout is going to be in terms of claims activity as a result of the um, the pandemic, and it's going to take a while for that to what to wash through. Right, However, right. what we also so. know is that the insurance market is cyclic. We're in a hard market at the moment. Uh, that you know um, cycle will move on, but uh, it, the you know huge question is when that's when that's going to be. So you know between now and then, what's you know just really um, important is for firms to keep risk management absolutely front and center, uh, and really invest time into preparation for their PI renewal. Um, and I think that's a really good note to to wrap up on is the investing is the investing time bit. Um, Jenny, thank you very much for, for joining. Um, I've left your contact details um, on the slide so um, people who are watching the recording um, can, I'm sure, drop you a question if they've Absolutely. got anything specific that they want to ask you. Um, I'd just like to thank those who've watched the recording. Um, apologies we couldn't do it live this morning, uh, but hopefully the, the quality of the content is just as good as it would have been. Um, and thanks for those that have tuned in. Um, I'll leave my um, contact details there as well. So if anybody got any questions for me, um, feel free to fire those across. Jenny, um, thank you very much for your time um, and for joining us. And it's good to speak to you as ever. Pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.